Well, welcome everyone uh, to this evening's History Revealed program, which is a partnership between the Eastside Freedom Library and the Ramsey County Historical Society. Um, I'm Peter Ratcliffe, the co-executive director at the Eastside Freedom Library. Um, and in a moment, uh, you'll hear from Robin Priestley from the Ramsey County Historical Society. Um, we've been doing these collaborations now for almost three years, um, and it's been really productive and delightful and community building and a great chance for people to talk not only to authors, but also to each other. Um, and we'll have time at the end of this evening's meeting uh, for people to unmute and visit. Robin will explain more about how you can raise questions uh, or make comments. Um, I want to make sure that you're aware that there are future programs coming up, and I want to particularly mention um, our collaboration coming up on Friday, April 23rd, uh, with a new book called From Hurt to Healing, uh, which has been produced by the wonderful Jan Mandel and the Irreducible Grace Foundation, and it's a book, an activity book. Um, that has been generated by oral interviews, conversations between um, young kids, particularly kids of color and elders in the Rondo community. Um, and that will be an event that we're doing on April 23rd. Hopefully you've signed up for our newsletter and you'll be learning of other future, future events. So I'm gonna get out of the way and turn things over to my colleague, Robin Priestley. Thank you, Peter. And thank you everybody at the Eastside Freedom Library. As Peter mentioned, we've been partners in our History Revealed programs for nearly three years now, and it's been fantastic. Um, we love being partners and we're working on more new programs in addition to the April 23rd. So another one coming up that's very important is on May 13th with uh, Professor Carlos Hill and he's going to be talking about his new book on the Tulsa massacre. It's a photographic history. Um, this is the centennial of that event, um, which was a terrible thing that happened in our country and a lot of people don't know about it. So it's gonna be a really important talk and I hope you can join us. You can see how to sign up on both the RCHS website and the Eastside Freedom website. And those links are on the screen behind me. Um, so while you're on our websites, please take a look at other programs. We have calendars of upcoming programs all the way through and we'll be working on more through the rest of the year. And while again, while you're there, consider supporting the Ramsey County Historical Society and the Eastside Freedom Library. We rely on support of our members and friends and supporters like you to continue to present these programs and all of our other programming efforts. And there are some really great benefits to joining, including our Ramsey County History Magazine, the Eastside Freedom Library has wonderful benefits and you're supporting your community through this. Um, so this program will be recorded and it uh, will be available on our RCHS YouTube channel as well as Eastside Freedom Library's YouTube channel within a couple days. I also wanna mention subtext books here. Their website is https colon slash slash subtextbooks.com and they carry the, all the books from our history reveal programming. I don't know if they have, Kim, if they have your book in yet. Um, last time I checked, it was on order, but um, feel free to check out subtext books and they are in downtown St. Paul, um, really close. So again, we like to support our local bookstores. Some technical reminders, please keep your microphones and personal cameras turned off and feel free to type your questions or comments in the chat box. And um, we'll have questions at the end of the program. Peter and I will be reading off the questions and we have our wonderful tech person, Carla, will be monitoring Facebook and she'll be gathering those questions as well. So we'll put those in the chat box and then our speakers can reply to those. But after the program, we'll turn off the recording, we'll turn off the live stream on, on Facebook and you may turn on your microphones and cameras at that point. We'll let you know when that's okay. So if you want to share something of a more personal nature that you don't want recorded, you may feel free to do that. Um, 
so we can all chat together and um, share some things. So the Ramsey County Historical Society is committed to presenting the stories and the histories of everyone in our community. And we are so pleased to bring you tonight's program. And I'm gonna turn it over to our speakers. And thank you both again for being with us tonight. Hey, thank you, Robin. And thank you, Peter. It's a real, it's a real pleasure to be here tonight. I'm Kim Haikala. That's Haikala or Haikala. I will answer to either. Um, I am just really pleased to be part of the Ramsey County Historical Society's History Revealed program. Again, I, I gave a talk um, in the earlier stages of this project some years ago and had a fantastic experience. And I'm really honored to be part of the Eastside Freedom Library's programming as well. Um, so just a couple of words about me and then I'll let the other Kim introduce herself and then we'll, I'll start sharing my screen and we'll kind of launch into the conversation. So I am a historian who focuses on mid 20th century women's history. I'm also an oral historian and a former educator. I taught uh, college level US and women's history for about 12 years. Um, I am also the parented daughter of a former Booth girl. And by Booth girl, I mean those women who resided and delivered babies at the Salvation Army's Booth Memorial Hospital in St. Paul. I am a birth sibling to my half sister, who you will hear from in just a minute, and I am an adoptive mother. So I have a number of connections to what we now refer to as the adoption constellation, and I am the author of Booth Girls. So Kim, the other Kim, go ahead if you wanna introduce yourself. Okay, hello. I'm the other Kim, um, Kim's <laughs> sister that was adopted away from the family. Um, my birth mom gave birth to me at Booth Hospital and um, put me up for adoption. So I did not find the family until 33 years later. And I got to meet my birth mom and sister and brother. Um, so I lived in Minnesota for about a year and then went all over the place. Right now I live in Michigan, um, work in an animal shelter here and do you want me to say anything else, Kim? Or yeah, we'll, 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 get, we'll get to more um, okay. details of your story as we go okay. on here. But right. that's one nice thing about the pandemic, I guess, and the technology that we have to rely on is that we can both be participating in an event like this, even though we're in different states. So, right. yeah. So I'm gonna start sharing my screen. Is that okay, Robin? Are we ready for yes, that? Yes, that would okay. be great. So when you're ready, um, share your screen. And then if you wanna tell us a little bit about the book and how you came to write it. Yeah. Okay, let's go. Okay, here we go. I'm just gonna adjust a couple of things on my screen so I can see properly. Okay, so yes, um, the story that the book tells, that Booth Girls tells for me started in 1994 when I first learned that I had a sister seven years older than I am whom I had never known about much less met. My mother told me an abbreviated version of her story one night over dinner at the Grand Round and uh, she said that she had gotten pregnant while she was a junior at the University of Minnesota in the spring of 1960. She had had her baby at Booth in early 1961, surrendered her for adoption, and then kept quiet for the whole thing, as Kim said, for 33 years. She was only telling me all of this now at the time in 1994 because her daughter, my sister, had recently found her. They had met and now my sister was coming back to meet the rest of us. And oh, by the way, my mom told me, your sister's name is Kim. <laughs> so just to you know, get that on the table, we are both named Kim. Um, we call each other Kim Senior, that's the other Kim, and Kim Junior, that's me. Um, but it was Kim's adoptive parents who named her Kim. My mother had, our mutual mother had named her something else. So fast forward to 2012, um, and my mother had been gone for three years by that time. She died in 2009. At that time, I was six years into being an adoptive mother. My first book had been published the year before. Uh, and at the time I was really filled with doubt uh, with my, about my abilities as a mother. I was still grieving the loss of my own and I was looking for a new project. And I realized that I had missed an opportunity to ask mom in detail about her experiences at Booth, which was a bit alarming to me since, as I said, I am a women's historian and an oral historian, and I hadn't <laughs> used any of those skills at the time to talk to my mom when I still had the chance. 
So I decided that my next project was going to be to try to learn about my mother and her experience as a quote booth girl um, using the, the professional skills I had developed as a historian as an, and as an oral historian. So I started doing some research. I did some reading. I did some writing. I poured through every archival and published source I could find about Ruth St. Paul. I read everything my mother had written about her first pregnancy. She was a very elegant and prolific writer. And I also was writing my way through my grief. Um, and in the course of this, I also interviewed a handful of other women who had had babies at Booth and relinquished them for adoption. So I tried to tackle the issue from as many angles as possible, you know, through this personal family story, through my um, historical research, through memoir, a bit of my own story as an adoptive mother, and through oral history. And that has led to this kind of blended style and structure of the book itself. So um, what you see here on the slide that I uh, got up there a little bit early is some of what I learned from my historical research into Booth. So the Salvation Army op first opened a rescue home for quote, fallen women in St. Paul in 1898. And at that time, they, by fallen women, they meant prostitutes, uh, women who had substance abuse issues, women, young girls who were runaways, uh, women who were thought to be sexually promiscuous, which oftentimes just meant sexually active. Um, they also tended to young women who came to the city from outstate and who were just trying to get their feet under them in the city. And they started taking care of unwed mothers. This home, this really kind of grainy photograph that you see on the screen here is from the first booth. Well, it wasn't called booth at the time. It was the Salvation Army Rescue Home. And it was located at Jackson and University in 1898. And the goal of this rescue home was to redeem these women through spiritual renewal provided by the good example of Salvationist women while tending to their material needs as well. So um, it, the rescue home moved to another rental spot, I think in 1904, but by 1912, it was really bursting at the seams. It was, it was full. And so they uh, relocated to its current, it's still there, the booth is still there on Como Avenue, 1471 Como Avenue. Uh, the Salvation Army still runs it. It is now called the Booth Brown House. It is a transitional housing program for young people. But in 1913, this was a big deal. It was, it opened in October of 1913. Booth had been funded by the Elsinger brothers of the Golden Rule Department Store of St. Paul. So these were some businessmen and some philanthropists who put up the money and the land for this new rescue home. And it was designed by Clarence Johnston, who was a colleague of Cass Gilbert and a state renowned, a renowned state architect. And we've all seen many of his buildings across the state. So at this time, what we see happening here, let me just check my slides. Okay, so that's, that's the vision of the completed Booth Memorial Hospital some years later. Um, and what's going on in the early part of the 20th century at rescue homes like what eventually becomes Booth, uh, not just here, but also around the country, is there's this growing tension between the evangelical women who founded these homes, these Salvation Army women, and a new class of professionalizing social workers who are coming in and saying, you know, we need to bring our skills and expertise to bear on the problem of unwed motherhood. Because by 1920, Booth was focusing only on unwed mothers, as were maternity homes across the country. So they were, they, you know, prostitutes and these other kind of, quote, fallen women had been turned to other resources and they were focusing exclusively on unwed mothers. And um, there was some real tension between social workers who wanted to use their scientific methods and casework counseling to redeem these women and the evangelical women who thought, you know, we really need to tend to their spiritual needs first. Um, but what I would like to point out, especially because it will be germane to the rest of our conversation tonight, is that for the first probably three, maybe four decades of the 20th century, the policy of Booth and of the Salvation Army in general in its maternity homes was to keep mother and child together. So you see on this slide here, a quote um, by Brigadier Annie Cowden, who was superintendent at Blue St. Paul in 1920, 1921. 
She does an interview with the Minneapolis Morning Tribune in January of 1921, and she says, the Salvation Army never separates mother and child. Part of the reason for that was that they believed that these women who had, you know, um, exhibited some, some moral um, failure in becoming pregnant outside of marriage could be redeemed through the nurturing care of their children, that that was their path to restoring themselves, to redeeming themselves and recovering their womanly virtue, if that was possible, they were going to do that by raising their children. Now, there was also sometimes a punitive aspect to that as well. There's a Ramsey County social worker who in 1913, I think it is, says that, you know, yeah, well, these, these women also need to be made to feel the effects of their transgression, I'm paraphrasing, but there was also a somewhat of a, a punitive aspect to that idea as well. But the practice was to maintain that bond between mother and child. Um, oh, did I hear something in the background? Okay, okay, I'll just keep going then. Um, I wanna make sure we have time to talk, talk with Kim here as well, so I, I won't take too much longer. Um, my mother, um, however, was born in 1957. I'm kind of, this slide is getting a, a bit ahead of the story here. Um, all of these attitudes towards what to do with these women in these maternity homes like Booth started changing in the post-World War II period. So part of the idea of why these mothers were supposed to take care of their children in the early decades of the 20th century also had to do with ideas about why they became pregnant out of wedlock to begin with. Um, originally, these evangelical women who started these homes thought, well, they were victims of predatory men. In the earlier decades of the 20th century, as the progressive era moves, um, as we move into the progressive area, era, there is a lot of attention to how the environment um, might have contributed to their moral failing. And then we move into the 20s and 30s where there's emphasis on these unwed mothers as delinquents, that there's something, um, you know, they're breaking society's moral codes, they're delinquents. And I know that Sheila O'Connor talked about her book at the Eastside Freedom Library in early 2020, Evidence of V, which is a beautiful book and one of my favorites. And her grandmother was caught up in that era. I think her grandmother was at Sox Center and I think it was 1937 because she had become pregnant out of wedlock. And so the idea was that these young women were delinquents and many of them ended up in delinquency institutions as well. That starts to change after World War II when um, we see this rise of uh, understanding in the social welfare community that young, well, that white women, whatever their age, who become pregnant out of wedlock are doing so because they are victim of psychological neuroses or psychological dysfunction that stems from dysfunction in their own families. And a lot of that dysfunction is laid at the feet of the mothers of the unwed mothers. Now, you know, that's, that's a troubling, of course, understanding of unwed motherhood, but in some ways it was seen as more progressive than some of those ideas that came before it. Because now the idea was that these young white pregnant women could be redeemed through casework counseling. They were redeemable, they were treatable. Social workers could come in, talk them through their problems, through their psychological dysfunction. They might see psychiatrists or psychologists and then, you know, they would, they would be restored and they could go on and resume their lives provided that they gave their babies up for adoption. So now we see that shift away from keeping mother and child together to separating them um, because adoption was supposed to be what was called the best solution. It was gonna allow these young white women to go on to the paths they were destined for, which ultimately meant married motherhood. And it was gonna serve these children well as well. These babies, the social welfare experts were saying, deserved a financially secure two-parent home. And so we were going, they, the social welfare apparatus, was going to place those children of the unwed mothers into a secure home. And what also, this best solution, the third prong of that would be it would solve the problem of infertility for those couples who were married 
and deserving, quote unquote, and economically secure and couldn't have children of their own. And so the adoption was going to solve all three of these problems at the same time, according to these experts. And if you think about what's going on in the post-war period, of course, this is also the baby boom. You know that. My mother graduated in 1957, which is the peak year of the baby boom. Um, 1957 is also the year that there were more than 200,000 babies born out of wedlock for the first time in U.S. history. So we see the, you know, more and more babies are being born, whether in within marriage or without. And it's also the era of this kind of idealized white middle-class nuclear family that really came to symbolize a lot of what America was supposed to be at the time. It was an economic engine of the, of the economy. It symbolized American virtue. It symbolized how Americans supposedly belonged to the nation. And it symbolized how, it, how the United States was distinguished from communist Soviet Union. And so there was a lot of emphasis on this white middle-class nuclear family. And it was really hard if you were a you know, white middle-class couple who wanted to partake of that but couldn't have children of your own. So adoption starts fulfilling all of these needs. And again, we'll talk about this in a second, but um, this is really a white woman's experience for many reasons. So I'm gonna check in and see where we're, where we're going here, okay. So Kim, did you want to talk a little bit more about women of color? What would happen to them if they got pregnant outside of marriage? Where did they go? Yes, yes, thank you. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So as I, I was saying, yes, this is a very much a white woman's experience, experience. Now, having said that, I would also like to point out that most white women who become pregnant outside of marriage at this time don't go to maternity homes either. Most women, um, or, you know, I, I forget what the statistic is, Ann Fessler writes about it, but most white women who get pregnant outside of marriage marry before they deliver their babies. So they turn an, quote, illegitimate pregnancy into a, quote, legitimate birth. Um, but those women who do go to maternity homes are overwhelmingly white. Um, those that are served in the network of Salvation Army maternity homes, there are about 35 or 36 at this time, uh, 80 5% of them are white. So yes, that leads to your question, Robin, about, well, what about these women of color who become pregnant outside of wedlock? What happens to them? Um, Ricky Solinger, some of you may be familiar with her, with her work. She has written in a book that kind of set the stage for a lot of what we know about this time period and this issue, that race was the single most important factor determining the experience of and the response to women who got pregnant outside of marriage in post-war United States. It defined the response to the woman herself and it defined the response to her baby, what to do with that baby. So um, to make the longer, more complicated story short, I do wanna just touch on a few highlights here. Um, so for, for various personal and cultural reasons, African-American and Native American women who became pregnant outside of marriage were often simply absorbed into their communities. Um, many social welfare experts, especially in the early post-war period, however, also viewed black and indigenous women really differently, differently than they viewed white women who became pregnant outside of marriage. Remember that those social welfare experts thought, well, white women have this psychological dysfunction that is treatable by casework counseling Many of those same experts just believed that African-American and Native American women in particular were just acting out kind of immutable biological characteristics that were beyond help. They were not um, amenable to the same kinds of treatment that white women were, and that the best hope, the best that we could hope for as a society was to keep them off the public welfare rolls if possible. So it was a very, very racist view of the causes and um, treatment and response to people who became pregnant outside of wedlock. Now, that said, some maternity homes uh, did admit women of color. There is evidence that there were both African-American and Native American women at Booth. I cannot find the records indicating numbers at all, but I have seen references to the fact that there were some indigenous and black women at Booth, small proportion because again, 85% of all women in Salvation Army homes were white. 
Um, but the other thing I want to say before we move on here is that there was also a real difference in not just what the social welfare apparatus should do for the pregnant woman of color, but what happened, what, what the response would be for her baby. Um, and again, due to different conceptions of what constitutes family and legitimacy, quote unquote, single pregnant women of color and their babies were sometimes absorbed into the culture or into extended family networks or through informal kinship or non-kinship adoptions. Um, those women of color who may have wanted to have their children adopted, however, faced obstacles. There was sometimes a shortage of, oops, I missed that one together. Uh, there was sometimes a shortage of adoptive homes for children of color. This is in part because this was an era of racial matching in adoption where white adopters wanted to adopt white babies. So there was no um, overt indication that their family was formed through adoption. Excuse me. Um, but there were also really prohibitive requirements of the adoption process itself. So by this time, the state is really regulating the adoption process uh, through licensed agencies. And those licensed agencies have a lot of really stringent requirements that adopters have to meet. That made it particularly difficult for um, prospective adopters of color sometimes. They had income requirements, they had housing requirements, there were sometimes requirements that uh, the wife of a prospective adoptive couple uh, does, did not have a job outside the home. So there were class and race-based structural obstacles that made it really difficult for people of color, black and indigenous people in particular in, in Minnesota to adopt children who may have needed homes. That starts to change as the post-war period goes on, as uh, liberal social workers come in and start saying, you know, no, no, we need to reevaluate our understanding of, of these women of color who are pregnant. Um, they need the same services that white women do. And we need to also open the adoption process to non-white adopters. So there are some efforts to do that. There's an effort in Minnesota in particular to do that. There's a program that runs from 1962 to 1965 um, that is designed originally to start um, attracting and recruiting non-white couples to adopt non-white children. But by the end of it, it really ends up being an, uh, an endorsement and a practice of transracial adoption, by which we mean white couples adopting non-white children. Um, and of course, we probably know a bit about uh, the Indian Adoption Project, a na nationwide project that was horrifying in its exploitation and abuse of uh, indigenous cultures um, that uh, Margaret Jacobs, a historian named Margaret, Margaret Jacobs argues that the Indian Adoption Project essentially was outsourcing the mission of assimilating indigenous people in the termination era um, by trying to find Native American children that white people could adopt. Um, so again, this is the termination era where uh, the federal government is kind of stepping away from its responsibility to tribes in certain, straight, in certain states and turning that over to the state. And the states are saying, oh, we don't necessarily wanna assume the economic burden here. Um, and so there's some really horrendous, horrendous stuff that happens under the guise of the Indian Adoption Project, such that in 10 years, the Indian Adoption Project placed 395 indigenous children in white families, making indigenous children 19 times more likely to be separated by adoption than other kids. And in Minnesota 1971, when Native Americans constituted only 0.6% of the state's population, almost one in four Native American children less than a year old were placed for adoption. So it's a really horrific, horrific track record here. And of course, those dynamics lead to the rise in transracial, transnational adoption, which is where my family comes in. So, um, but for mom and her baby in 1961, the best solution of adoption was in full play. 
So Kim, thank you for sharing that. Um, you interviewed a number of women who had babies at Booth and relinquished them for adoption for the book. Do you wanna speak a little bit about them and how they felt with this best solution, um, if it was the best option for them or if yeah. they preferred something else? Yeah, yeah, sure, that, I, I would. So as I said, I'm an oral historian and um, you know, the, this book project really started as a way for me to understand my mother better in her absence, and particularly about her experience at Booth, especially because at the time, as I said, I was, I was really felt I was coming up short in my own mothering. So I thought one of the best ways that I could understand more about what she might have experienced was to talk to other women who had had similar experiences. So thanks to a couple of legacy grants that were um, awarded to the Minnesota Independent Scholars Forum, I was able to interview, do oral history interviews with seven former Booth girls, as well as one woman who had been a nurse at Booth for five years and uh, one woman who had worked as a Ramsey County caseworker for a number of years and worked with these, these young women at Booth. So all seven of the Booth girls that I met did relinquish a child born outside of marriage um, though some of, several of them also retained custody of other children that were also born outside of marriage. And, and what I'd like to say, I mean, their, their stories are kind of central parts of the book. And I, I can't do justice to them now, just in retelling them. But I will say, as far as the, quote, best solution goes, you know, some of these women, some of them were quite young. They were in their teens. Some of them were early 20s. Um, some of them really wanted to keep their babies had they had the resources available to them, the support of their families, the ability to do so, they would have done, they would have done it. Um, and one, actually one woman did. She kept the first baby that she delivered at Booth. She raised him as a single mother for a while. She got pregnant again outside of marriage and decided, and this is according to her, her own account of this. She decided then that she had to surrender her second child for adoption because she felt she wasn't giving her first child the life that he deserved. So she did end up surrendering her second child. Um, and a couple of the women said, you know, that they made a decision that adoption would be the best for their babies because they couldn't support them. Um, and because sometimes they didn't feel ready to parent themselves. That said, you know, we have to understand that that the range of options avail available to these women were really limited. Had there been resources, had there been a, a support network set up for these sometimes girls, sometimes young women to take care of their babies, they may have wanted to do that, but they knew given the situation that they were living in that it was not a viable option for them. Um, and so they ended up surrendering regardless of whether they felt pressured to surrender or whether they chose it as freely as they could have in that circumscribed circumstance, all of those women talked about how painful it was to let those babies go, um, how difficult it was to move on, how that best solution stopped for them. It didn't work. They weren't able to just put this experience behind them and you know, just kind of glide into their future lives, that this was something that stayed with them for the rest of their lives and still does. It still does, even though most of them have been reunited with their children. Um, and they all talked about, in particular, the shame and the stigma that surrounded uh, unwed motherhood or unwed pregnancy at the time and how unevenly that shame, shame came to bear on women. While oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes their male partners could just you know, avoid the situation entirely. I would like to say though that some men, whether you know, young teenagers themselves or, or older men did act very honorably. They, you know, would have, they stuck by their partners. Um, sometimes it was the, the male, the father who wanted to keep the baby and it was the mother saying, you know, no, I, I can't do this. Um, but by and large, you know, a lot of these women did talk about how unfair this burden of sexual propriety, uh, how unfair it was that, that that really rested on the shoulders of the young women. There's Kim. There's Kim. Aww. So, Kim, what's your take 
Um, you know, part of, I, I guess this is kind of a, a good segue. We've been talking about, you know, adoption as a solution to these various um, challenges or, or social quote problems. Um, and one of the, the prongs of that best solution was that it was really gonna give, uh, give these children, these adopted children, a good life. So just tell us a little bit about what it was like for you to grow up in your okay. family. Can you hear me? Can you no, hear me? We can hear you. Okay. Okay. So, um, you know, having met my birth mother, um, eventually I realized what a wonderful person she was. And I can't help but think that if somehow we would have stayed together that, you know, she would have been a great mom. We would have been okay somehow. But that being said, I was given up for adoption and these are my adoptive parents. And I really, if I would have been able to just go through a book and, and look at parents and families and pick out the best one, this is, this would have been them. So I feel like I, I lucked out in the adoption lottery and, you know, I had just a really wonderful life and great parents. I always knew I was adopted. I thought it was kind of cool as I got older, a little bit special, like, I had, you know, something that other people couldn't relate to and they always wanted to ask about it. And um, I was raised the only child, so it was just the three of us. And yeah, I was lucky. So Kim, um, can you talk a little bit about why, it, why your parents decided to adopt to form your family? Yeah, they had um, tried for a couple of years to have, um, you know, to become pregnant and it turned out my mom couldn't. So they had started uh, uh, paperwork I have copies of two years before I was born, um, asking, um, you know, the various counties and departments in Minnesota for help in adoption. And uh, I always like to tell people that it took two years to get me. So I must have been extra special, not just nine months. Um, so. Did that's, your, that's why. Did your mom and dad talk to you about that process of going through the adoption process? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I have lots of um, letters um, and copies of correspondence and, you know, it just, it was a long process, as you know. <laughs> yeah, I do know. Um, yeah. Did, I, and I'm just curious because um, one of the things, there's a book out there called Baron in the Promised Land and it's about, about, families, couples that can't have, that are facing infertility during the post-war period um, by Elaine Tyler May. May. And she talks about, you know, we were talking about earlier, I mentioned uh, how many social welfare experts viewed these young women who became pregnant outside of wedlock as kind of neurotic and psychologically dysfunctional. Well, a lot of those same assumptions um, held for women who couldn't get pregnant during this time. There were a lot of social welfare experts who were saying, well, you know, they can't get pregnant because they haven't um, fully adapted to or, or you know, uh, embraced their feminine side. And maybe there was something wrong with their mothers. I mean, so a lot of these same really sexist, gender biased assumptions were faced by women who couldn't get pregnant either. So it was not an easy time to kind of fall oh outside gosh. of that nuclear family ideal in any way. Did That's your mom? Perfect ever say anything about like about her personal experience of going she did it no process? I don't know if she ever felt like that I know um in much later years she was pretty certain that had she been um trying to get pregnant in modern times that she would have been able to because of medical advances you know her situation wasn't um such that it couldn't be overcome now okay but um no, I don't know. I mean, I never got the feeling that she felt inferior about that or anything. And I've been part of my adopted family and my extended family, my cousins and aunts and uncles, and um, I'm just as much a part of the family as anybody else. I never felt like I wasn't. Yeah. Okay. And what did you, what information did you have about your birth mother, which is of course our shared? We had just a list of facts. Uh, she was a uh, uh, university student. She was tall and pretty. She was Norwegian. Well, I was Norwegian and Irish. So I didn't know who, actually who that came from. Uh, uh -huh. And she, I, I knew that my birth father um, had found out about me, my um, eminent arrival and skipped the country and was never heard from again. So 
So that's pretty much what I knew. Mm -hmm. And as you were growing up, what were you, I mean, what were you thinking about your birth mom? Did you think about her? Did you wonder about her? Like what presence in your life did she? Oh my gosh. Yeah. It's, it's kind of um, an odd feeling to not be biologically related to anybody that you know. So I never looked like anybody in the family. It didn't bother me, but it was just weird. It was like a big question mark came over my head. And I wondered if she was okay. And if I could ever meet her, I never really imagined that I would, but it was kind of like a dream to maybe find out about my family one day, you know? Mm -hmm. How did you eventually find out about your family? Okay. Well, um, when I turned 18, I um, decided I was going to go looking and my mom was totally supportive of me. She said, if you want, you know, if you need help, let me know. I mean, I, I'm fine with that. Um, I wrote a letter to uh, the county that processed the adoption. It was on the paperwork that I had. So I wrote a letter um, saying, hey, I was adopted. What can I find out? And I got a letter back saying, well, you can't find out anything. This was in 1979, I believe. But um, you can write a letter to us and we'll put this letter in your file. And if anybody inquires about you, we'll have that, that letter there and we'll introduce you that way. So I wrote a letter and thank goodness for carbon paper, because in those days I stuck a piece of carbon paper and another paper behind it. And I typed out my letter and mailed it. And then I had that copy of that letter and I just stuck it in a file in my drawer. And I didn't think of it again for many years until I was, I think, 33. I was um, cleaning up those doors finally and came across this letter and I noticed that it had basically two last names to go and five addresses ago. like nobody could ever find me with that letter. So I thought, well, I better update this just for the heck of it. So I did. And there wasn't anything in my file waiting for me, but the laws had changed, the rules had changed. And so what I got back was a packet of information and they were allowed to send me non-identifying information um, about my birth family and um, my mother. So it was information that they had taken from her when she got to Booth um, about her parents, her siblings, where she went to school, why she was giving up for adoption. All of that was written down and, and they were supposed to black out with a marker the last names and any addresses and stuff like that, right? So they did all through it except for one place where they failed to block out the last name. Um, and I think kind of, I kind of just get the idea that they were trying to help me. Someone was trying to help me maybe and say, well, we just will leave this one little clue for her. Anyway, so I had that last name. I had three brothers and parents and I figured, well, this should be doable. We should be able to find somebody here. And so along with that information, I had gotten um, a brochure for a group of searchers, adoption searchers that would um, aid you in finding your family if you were adopted away. So I contacted the link, the person from Minnesota and I sent her this packet and just, it took her like probably a few clicks on her computer at that point to find her, to find Sharon um, through her parents' obituaries. And she called her up and um, that must've been quite a phone call and, um, you know, hooked us up by phone. And my husband and I were just happened to be driving from Michigan all the way through Minnesota the next day to go to a family event. And so we stopped by and spent the day there and it was just the most incredible day ever. So that's how I found you guys. And there's that day. Yeah, there's that day. Yep. Um, okay, I'm gonna, I'll leave that up there for a few more seconds and then I'll stop sharing my screen so we can, we can see everybody. But, um, I, I know you just said it was an incredible day, but I mean, what it what was it like to meet your birth, not just your birth mom? And I know how, what are you going to say? Because here I am, right? <laughs> You're not going to say anything to hurt my feelings. But what was it like to meet me? Um, what was it like to meet your birth family that you you know hadn't known? No, Sharon and I just kind of stared at each other and and held on to each other like we couldn't even believe it. She was so ready to meet me. She had gotten all these pictures of the family and she had all this little family tree written out for me. So I, I would know who's who and pictures of everybody she had um, gotten ready for me. It was just, I don't know, I can't explain it. Really exciting, really exciting. I got to 
to meet somebody that I was related to. I found out about you and my brother. And uh, oh, there they are. <laughs> and uh, I got to meet you guys. You know, I told Sharon, if, if you don't want to tell them, that's okay. I understand. Because I didn't want to be intrusive in her life and cause any problem. But she said, no, I want to tell them. And so she invited me back to town a couple months later. And we had a big picnic and the whole family came. And it was just really ideal. I, of course, didn't know it was going to turn out that way. Sometimes it doesn't. And I was just right. lucky then. Um, yeah. Yeah, it really is a um, probably kind of an ideal, there we go, an ideal reunion situation because as you say, not all reunions are easy or comfortable. And oftentimes they go in, in cycles where, you know, there's periods of kind of the honeymoon period and then it, it declines and, and stuff like that. So, um, how, yeah, how would you describe your relationship with, you know, m mom? your birth mom as it evolved over the years? Sharon was really good at communicating. And like you've said, she was a really great writer. She wrote letters and they would, they would just be beautiful and they would make you cry. She and my mom corresponded by letter. She had written some um, pieces about when she was pregnant and uh, other things about her mother and her grandmother. And just reading those and talking to her, I felt like I, you know, I had a connection to all these people. Like I was here because of them. And it was the first time hearing family stories that I um, felt like this means something to me. Like I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for them. And um, so, I don't know. I learned a lot about the family that way from her writing. Yeah, and, and her writing, I should just make clear to others. Um, her writing was a really critical piece for me in terms of how I was trying to learn about her because I think it was at your house Kim when I was visiting you many years ago I was in graduate school at the time and you showed me that essay called Greyhound which so so before my mom ended up at Booth her first reaction when she found out she was pregnant was she didn't tell anybody she didn't tell her mom and dad she it was a spring of her junior year at the university and she decided she was going to go to California and she was going to have her baby and raise her baby in California so she finishes out the spring term and she buys a ticket on the Greyhound bus and she goes to San Francisco and she writes about this in that essay called Greyhound where she you know writes about that trip she was feeling she had morning sickness she felt terrible she didn't feel particularly safe she gets out to San Francisco um, stays at the YWCA out there which I have visited and uh, just realizes how overwhelmed she is. And she realizes that, you know, as much as she thought she could do this by herself, she, she can't. Um, so she stays for a couple of days, does kind of a half-hearted search for a job, for a place to live, realizes how difficult that would be and decides that, you know, whatever music she's gonna face at home, she'd rather do that than stay in San Francisco. So she gets on the Greyhound, goes back home, tells her mother, that she's pregnant and her mother, my grandmother says, yeah, I already know because I got a letter from Booth. So, you know, mom didn't tell her right after she got home. She must have contacted Booth somewhere in between. And by the time she feels she has to tell her parents that she's pregnant, she has made contact with Booth. Booth has sent a letter to the house where mom is living with her parents. And my grandmother intercepts the letter and realizes what's going on but she has waited for my mom to tell, tell her. And she says to my mom, you know, well, you're gonna have to tell your dad. Um, my mom was the apple of her daddy's eye. She was a daddy's girl. And she told him she was pregnant and he did not respond well initially. He was quite upset and that broke her heart into a million pieces. Um, she said, you know, he recovered a few days later and, and they, they rel relatively speaking came to terms with it, but they decided somehow between the three of them that mom would stay in the room under the eaves of that story and a half house in Blaine until she reported to Booth because this was such a horrific thing that she was doing was, you know, she was bringing shame upon the whole family because she had gotten pregnant while she was single um, that they had to hide her 
And, and she did that. She stayed in that room under the eaves for about six months. And uh, according to her own account and what she told you and me, she didn't leave that room for six months um, until she reported to Booth. And, you know, I've, I've told that story to people and they say, how could your grandparents have done that? You know, what a horrible thing they did. But if you look back at that time period, and as I was saying earlier, you know, the explanation for a white woman's unwed pregnancy was that there was something wrong at home. And a lot of times what was wrong at home was that the mother of the unwed mother hadn't embraced her femininity, hadn't fully adapted to her proper feminine role. And so she kind of, or hadn't loved her daughter enough um, at home. And so I, you know, I have sympathy for my grandparents as well because they were under the microscope as well in this context. So she stays no, in that I room they were protecting the rest of the, the rest yeah. of the family because if a, the stigma stuck to Sharon and the parents, it's going to stick to the siblings as well. Like, oh, Absolutely. you can't go around with those kids because they're, you know, whatever. Yep. So yeah, then I understand that. Yep, absolutely. So I don't, I don't bear them any, any ill will at all. I do, I think it's a real shame that neither of them were around by the time you found mom, because boy, they would have loved to have met you. You know, my grand, grandma saw you. She did go and visit you and mom after you were born at Booth. This is according to my aunt, Diane, our aunt Diane told me this story. And she goes to visit and she sees you and she comes home and she tells the kids who are old enough to understand, you know, Sharon had a beautiful baby girl. And that's well, all Sharon, they said about it. She helped, she helped me. Yeah. 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 So she, I mean, you know, my grandmother had six kids. She would have known, been able to imagine how hard it would have been mm -hmm. to leave a baby behind. But nobody talked about it after that. It was just radio silence for 33 years. My dad knew. Mom told my dad. Yeah. Um, so he helped her keep that secret, you know, for all those years. But nobody talked about it at all, which is really damaging. That's a real yeah. damaging way to live. So um Kim, what do you without um revealing any any details that maybe we shouldn't, uh any thoughts about your birth father? Well, I do have thoughts. They're not really very positive thoughts because he was just a louse. I mean, he, 1960, Sharon said to him, I'm pregnant, we have to get married. And he uh, left, never to be heard from again. And um, so, you know, I, although I, I really don't care about him meeting him or knowing him as a person, I think there's another whole half of my, my family and my heritage. So I have found out a little bit through um, um, Ancestry.com because I did a DNA test and I was matched with some of that family. So I, I've been able to, to just kind of spy on, on their family trees and the records. And so I know some things, but I haven't met anybody over there and probably won't for a while. Um, but like I said, I, he's no big loss. <laughs> That's what I think. <laughs> yeah. And again, you know, like I said earlier, not all male partners uh, were that irresponsible right. about the situation. I have, I know at least a couple of them who, you know, were very, did as much as they could to support their, their female counterpart and, you know, would have been happy to get married or raise that child or, or support whatever, whatever was best. But, um, and, and I guess the, the reason I, don't have the highest opinion of him either is that he had been married and divorced and a father already by mm -hmm. this time so he wasn't a youngster you know who was scared i mean he might have been scared but you know he yeah it's kind of an unfortunate thing so and you know okay so he's young and he takes off but he could have called sharon up in a year and said hey how are you you know do you need anything what happened do you have the baby you know any time in her whole life, he could have reached out to her to find out and nothing. And so that just doesn't make me feel very good about him. I'm just looking at the clock here. Okay, so I think it's eight o'clock there. I'm out of state at the moment, but I think it's eight o'clock there. So I don't know, Robin, if there are any questions that are coming in. 
on the chat or Facebook or whatever that we might want to address or what, what you would like to do. Yeah, thank you both. Um, we so appreciate your being so open and sharing your personal stories. Um, right now, please feel free to put your questions in the chat. There was a couple comments. Um, Linda mentioned that her grandmother uh, showed up as an inmate at the Sock Center um, birth home in the 1930 census. So she's mm -hmm. very interested in tonight's presentation because she's learning about her grandmother's life in that facility. Did you look, Kim, at any, um, I mean, I know that the book focuses on the Booth Hospital. Did you look at any of the other um, hospitals or maternity homes around the area? You know, I didn't very much. I will say a couple of things. Um, so I, I referred earlier to a social work professor from the University of Minnesota who was studying these girls at Booth. She wrote a book, I think it was published in 1965 or seven or six, somewhere in there, I can't remember the date. It's called The Ades Adolescent Girl in Conflict. And she goes off and she interviews these young women because she was specifically focused on teenagers between 14 and 19. And she goes off to Booth Memorial Hospital. Booth at this time was one of three maternity homes in the Twin Cities area. There's also, also the Lutheran Girls Home and the Catholic Infant Home in St. Paul. Lutheran Girls Home is in Minneapolis. And she goes in and interviews young pregnant girls at all three of these maternity homes. And those interview materials are available at the Social Welfare History Archives at the University of Minnesota. So I looked at some of that. Um, the Sox Center records are, all, are at the Minnesota Historical Society. And I have to say, it's interesting, I have, did not look at those for this book, for this research at all, uh, particularly because in the 30s, um, it, it was just a little bit earlier than the time period I was focusing on. Um, but many years ago when I was in graduate school, I was a research assistant for Molly Ladd Taylor, who, did, who um, was from Canada, a historian in Canada. And she was doing some work on eugenic sterilization in Minnesota. And at that time, all those years ago, I did look at those records from Sock Center because a lot of what was happening then in the 20s and 30s was these girls who were, who became, who were sexually active um, not necessarily those who became pregnant, but who were sexually active at this time and declared feeble-minded. Um, so this would have been in what, the 1920s era, I think, maybe a little bit earlier, a little bit later. Um, sexually active girls, runaways, uh, were often declared feeble-minded and they were sent to places like Stock Center Homeschool for Girls where they were sometimes sterilized. This was a way of stopping these young women from propagating uh, the bad seed, quote unquote, that they apparently had, their feeble-mindedness, right? Um, it was viewed as an inheritable defect that was part of the whole eugenic sterilization period where we you know, wanted to make sure the race, uh, only the proper people were, were reproducing the race. So I did look at some of those Sox Center records for that project many years ago. Um, but not for, the, and so, so when I said that, that there was, or maybe I didn't say this and just meant to, but there's a lot of problem with the idea of these young pregnant women in the post-war period being viewed as neurotic and as, you know, victims of psychological dysfunction. But at the time it was looked at as a kinder understanding, a more progressive, a more sympathetic understanding then something like that. Then the era where they were kind of automatically sent to uh, Sock Center, declared delinquents, um, where they were sometimes looked at as feeble-minded, as in as you know possessing this inheritable trait that was something we didn't want to propagate. So in some ways, at the time, this conception of women who got pregnant outside of wedlock as psychologically dysfunctional but amenable to treatment was uh, a, a step towards sympathy and empathy, troubling though it was. Um, somebody mentioned in the chat, the WCCO Dave Moore piece on Edward Weathers that was, came out in 1960. So it's right at the time mom is pregnant, you know, she's living in the, 
um, in the room at home. And WCCO has started this new documentary series where they're doing half hour pieces on the social issues of the day. And they do a whole segment called Unwed Mothers that focuses on Booth specifically. It's a fascinating historic archival find. You can find it online. It's at the um, Peabody Archives because it won a Peabody Award. Um, but, you know, Dave Moore, I mean, he's, you know, early in his career, for those of you who know him as the, the news anchor of the Twin Cities, he, you know, introduces this program and he's talking about this problem of unwed mothers and, and what Booth is doing for them. And he really is trying to be very, you know, to stir people's sympathy. Uh, oh, he and a lot of social welfare experts, even the ones who are advocating the best solution, even, you know, people in the Salvation Army are saying, look, these girls aren't feeble-minded. They aren't delinquents. They're anybody. They can be your neighbors. They can be your um, daughters, your sisters. You know, so it was, uh, even though that view of them as, as neurotic is troubling in retrospect, it was <laughs> an attempt to be more understanding and to be kinder um, and more therapeutic in our response to them than, than the ideas that had preceded that. So I did want to mention that um, Clarence put a link in the chat um, for Sheila O'Connor's event at the Eastside Freedom Library for Evidence of V. So that will take you to the YouTube recording of that program. And also mentioned several people mentioned Elaine May's book, Baron in the Promised Land, Childless Americans in the Pursuit of Happiness. So those are other resources that people might be interested in. Yeah. Um, and I believe you answered Lisa's question about what, what made females feeble-minded, but Jane had a question about how did the Booth girls or how were the adoptions arranged? So adoption, ha. Huh. So the, the other thing that's happening um, throughout the 20th century is you see increasing regulation of adoption by the state. So these adopt, Booth was not a, an adoption agency. Booth was just there to serve the unwed mothers. Um, while they were pregnant and, and it was a hospital, unlike the Catholic infant home and the Lutheran or Catholic infant home and the Lutheran girls home, Booth did have a hospital on site, which made it rather unique, at least in the Twin Cities era, area. Um, so, you know, it could provide a residence for these girls in the last months of their pregnancy, and then it could, uh, they could deliver their babies right there. But at that point, Booth itself did not handle or manage the adoptions. The counties often did that. Um, so in Kim's case, I think we were talking earlier, uh, maybe before we opened up the, the Zoom, um, since my mother had grown up and lived in Anoka County, Anoka County was responsible for um, providing a caseworker. So mom's caseworker, a woman by the name of Patricia Pert was from Anoka County. So she came in and did all these interviews with mom. Um, and then her Anoka name. County. Yeah, yeah. her name, Anoka. by the way, Patricia Purr was all over my parents' paperwork too. So they, okay. she dealt with my parents and probably handed me off, you know, so she knew yep. both, both sides. Yep. So it was often the county, a, a licensed adoption agency that would come in and make these matches and kind of do the interviews on both, both sides of the fence there. Yeah. Um, I was going to say something else, but now it has escaped me. So. Yeah, no, okay. we'll so let me, you. this is Peter jumping in. There have been a number of questions about sources, how people can, can get at sources. I wonder, Kim, if you would just walk us through what's at the Historical Society, what's at the University of Minnesota, are there Lutheran social service agency records, where are other pe places people might look? Okay, so, so there's a distinction perhaps here between kind of historical sources and sources if people are looking for, for birth family. Um, so I'll tell you just a little bit about, about what I did. So to learn about Booth, um, the Minnesota Historical Society has some records from Booth, but not much from the Salvation Army itself. I found a lot of information about Booth at the Minnesota Historical Society, however, through associated kind of state and county level and government agencies that were interacting with Booth to kind of regulate its operation. 
So the United Way, the United Fund, um, because Booth was supported in part by United Fund funds, has a lot of information about Booth. Um, uh, the various, uh, the State Board of Control, which you know morphs into various other state agency agency names. Uh, those records are at the Minnesota Historical Society. The Social Welfare History Archives at the University of Minnesota has a treasure trove of information that pertains to historical information about child welfare, about adoption. Um, it has the Child Welfare League of America records. It has the records just, and this is new, um, the records of Concerned United Birth Parents Minnesota are now at the Social Welfare History Archives of Minnesota. They were just landed there just as I was winding up my research. So those records are there. That is a fantastic place to go if you're interested in um, kind of child welfare, any kind of social welfare history. The Salvation Army National Archives in Alexandria, Virginia, however, and this may be what some of the questions are, are aiming at, have the, has the records of, of Booth and its network of maternity homes across the country. Um, I went there uh, courtesy of one of those legacy grants and I was given access to historical documents about Blue St. Paul, about the Women's Social Services Department of the Salvation Army that, that, um, that ran the network of maternity homes. What I could not access without a court order, which I did not get, was any kind of records about individual women or babies who were born, who, who stayed or were born at Booth. They do have them. So I believe that if you were a woman who had a baby at Booth, or you were a person who was born at Booth, you can contact the Salvation Army National Archives in Alexandria, Virginia, and see if you can access your records. I could have done that on behalf of my, now that mom is dead, I would have had to do it by getting Kim. I think Kim could have made a request and you might even need a court order um, to access your own records there. I'm not sure about that. So the people that sent the something... record, that was Anoka County, not Booth, in other right. words, right? right? Yes, yes, you didn't, I don't think you, your mom had anything from the Salvation Army itself. Okay. Um, but yeah, that is a huge issue, this on, ongoing issue about access to, um, there are different kinds of records that people are, need access to or might like access to. One is the original birth certificate. And that is the one that has you know, come up at the legislature time after time after time is um, this request for adoptees to have the right to have access to their original birth certificate. And it continues to be either tabled or rejected outright. Um, but then there are also agency records, um, you know, of the agency that might have handled adoptions. And then there are also court records. So there are three different kinds of records that adoptees and or birth parents might seek access to in different spots. And it's not easy. It is a, um, it's a labyrinth, but there are organizations out there that can help you. There's, um, there's the Adoptee Rights Law Center that is based, I think in Minneapolis, it's in Minnesota anyway, um, that does a lot of work on this. And there are a lot of adoption reform support groups that do a lot of work on this. CUB does a lot of work on uh, adoptee rights, meaning you know, trying to ensure that adoptees have the right to access their original birth certificate, um, meaning, um, the birth certificate that has their original names and the, the name of their actual birth mark. So Kim, I don't think I heard you mention uh, Catholic church records or Catholic charities records. And I know someone who was able to find personal records at in Massachusetts at mm. some point the Catholic hierarchy opened all their records. Now, I don't know if that's been city by city, state by state, if that's worldwide. Um, I, and I don't even know where Catholic church organizational records are 
here in Minnesota, whether they've gone to the historical society, whether they're still in the hands of the archdiocese, I, I don't know. But I wouldn't be surprised that that could be a rich source of information if those records were open to researchers or individuals. Yeah, I wish I knew more about that myself and I don't. Um, so, so those records might be really useful if, if, you, if a person was born or a woman gave birth at Catholic infant home. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't, I don't know where those records are and how open they are, but it's a good, it's a good question.